Hello and welcome to Sightgeist, where we talk about the psychology of the era, the science of games. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Covert, and on this episode of State of the Research, we're going to be talking about loot boxes. There have been several debates brewing about loot boxes, about their ethicality, are they ethical design? Are they gambling mechanics? Should they be considered gambling and therefore regulated among players under the age of 18? And are these mechanics quote unquote addictive? If you've seen my previous episodes about gaming disorder, you can probably figure where I stand on that last one. If you saw the jargon schmargon on loot boxes already, you'll know that loot boxes are in-game mechanics that a player purchases and receives a randomized in-game item. The kind of loot within a loot box varies, but it could be something to customize your in-game avatar, a new skin or new hair. It could be in-game equipment like weapons or armor, or it could be a consumable item like a potion. Loot boxes can be bought with in-game currency and or real money, and sometimes the contents of a loot box can be traded among players for real money. And this last point is key when it comes to talking about regulation. Loot boxes originated from MMORPGs, but today they can be found across games, across platform, across genre, and popular titles like FIFA, Fortnite, and Overwatch. Loot boxes are incredibly popular. A study from the University of York in 2019 found that 71% of the top games on Steam, a popular platform where people download games, contained loot boxes. So let's touch on some of the controversy, starting with perhaps the most prevalent one, its links to gambling. There is a general concern that loot boxes are a form of gambling. Parents fear that these mechanics can quote unquote condition their children to playing and spending more. And this could also lead in the long term to an increased problem in gambling among children and teenagers. Whether or not we agree that loot boxes are gambling, I tend to lean to them not being gambling, but I will get to that. The underlying concern is that the psychological mechanism that is behind gambling and behind loot boxes is the same. They are a form of intermittent reinforcement with a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. For more on that, go back to the episode of Jargon Schmargen on loot boxes. Despite what may seem like a similarity on face value, loot box mechanics work on gacha mechanics, which is kind of like a lottery in a virtual world. However, with gambling, you're betting money or a valuable asset to try and get higher returns than the original amount. Gacha mechanics, which underlie loot boxes, is all about pulling a lottery and getting a randomly allocated item that varies in rarity. It's also important to note that loot boxes almost always have free and paid options. While you may have to wait an extended period of time to get that free option, it is available to you. The other big difference is in gambling, a player can lose their bet, but with loot boxes, you have flexible probability. You always get a virtual prize. It may not be what you wanted, but you always get something. Trust me, that is not how it works in Las Vegas. They just take your money. Many lawmakers have jumped on the bandwagon to try and regulate loot boxes. In 2020, the UK House of Lords recommended the legal classification of loot boxes in video games as gambling. Included in the report's findings on problem gambling was the recommendation that loot boxes and video games be immediately reclassified by the government to fall under the remit of the 2005 Gambling Act. However, experts are divided on the need to regulate them in this way. For example, Dr. Zendo from the University of York said that spending money on loot boxes could be a gateway to gambling. However, that was correlational research and IMHO not enough evidence for regulation. Dr. Shabilsky from the Oxford Internet Institute says it would be, quote, apocalyptically stupid to regulate loot boxes, which is probably the best quote of this video, as it would essentially mean putting an 18 plus label on a wide range of games that are aimed at children like Fortnite and FIFA. So if we can agree that loot boxes are significantly different in various ways to gambling, as stipulated before, that still leaves open the question of whether or not they are ethical design. For me, loot boxes would fall under what Dr. Celia Hoden calls a shady practice or a dark pattern. Dark patterns occur when, instead of placing players at the center of the creation process, companies place their business goals at the center. Dr. Hoden believes that avoiding loot boxes in all games that aren't rated for adults only or mature within the ESRB rating system, which is 18 or plus, is the most ethical option. Ethical being the key word here. It isn't about legalities because loot boxes are not, at least at the time of filming this video, considered gambling in legal terms. 
For some, this may seem extreme, as Dr. Shabilsky would probably say. But in Dr. Houghton's own words, when talking about the psychological impact, she says, quote, what is more concerning is the potential impact of loot boxes on children and teenagers, although it is still not clear today. Children and teenagers do not have a mature prefrontal cortex, which can make automatic and conditioned responses much harder for them to control if need be. If you're wondering why children are so bad at refraining from doing an action if they don't hear Simon Says first, this is why. It is also why your teenagers have a greater tendency to partake in risky behaviors than adults past the age of 25. So loot boxes tied to monetization in a game can potentially, in my opinion, be an issue if children or even teenagers play this game, especially when the game is popular and they feel particularly compelled to buy loot boxes until they obtain a prize that is fashionable at school. Peer pressure, even bullying, which could happen in yesteryear if a teenager wasn't wearing the fashionable brands, can happen today with trendy virtual goods. And yes, if you are thinking, isn't this just like Pokemon cards, Kinder Eggs, baseball cards? Indeed it is. But there's a key difference between getting a new pack of Pokemon cards and opening up a new season's card pack on FIFA. And that is what Dr. Houghton calls natural obstacles. Now, when I was a kid, I loved X-Men comics, and there was a point at which I was getting very into X-Men collectible cards. It's like baseball cards, but for mutants, yellow Wolverine costume for life. Anyone else? Was it just me? It couldn't have just been me. Now, there were a lot of obstacles for me to get those card packs. First, I had to have money, right? That was obstacle number one, because Texas was too hot to mow lawns, and my parents were very stingy with chore money. Then I had to convince my parents to drive me to the comic book store, which was several cities away, like at least 30 minutes because I lived in a tiny town in Texas where I could only dream to have a neighborhood comic book store. Then the store had to have these cards. Um, I don't remember them being that popular, so there's a good chance that the store might not even have the cards. Then when I got the cards, I had to hope I got the card that I wanted. Come on, Jubilee. That's a lot of steps. Now, if I want a Neuer card in FIFA, I don't know how cards work in FIFA, but I do know about the German national soccer team. I just have to click a few buttons. Boom, there. In my X-Men card scenario, I had to be patient. I had to persevere through begging my parents to drive 30 minutes to the comic book store. I had to delay my gratification for a significant amount of time to get through all those steps. But with the FIFA cards, these steps do not exist. The effort is just lax parental controls and a few clicks. So you can see how the ethical debate is a bit more of a gray area when it comes to loot boxes. People under the age of 25 have a harder time, generally speaking, controlling their impulses because of the lack of a fully developed prefrontal cortex as discussed by Dr. Houghton in that quote earlier. You have fear of missing out. You have social pressures from your friends. So perhaps having these in a system, in a game for under 18s is a bit of a shady or deceptive practice. The player isn't being put at the center of the design, the monetization is. That does not make them gambling. Then we have the addiction question, which you know is my favorite. Loot boxes are enticing. There is no doubt that they are enticing, even to those over the age of 25. Virtual Skinner boxes, if you will, everything about them is designed to make you want to buy them. The colors, the sounds, the rewards, the confetti. Addiction, however, is a psychiatric term with clinical boundaries, guidelines, assessments. Currently, the only behavioral addiction recognized by the American Psychiatric Association is gambling addiction, and we have established that loot boxes do not fall under the heading of gambling, at least as the qualifications stand now. So for them to be considered quote unquote addictive, there would have to be a new qualification or a diagnose to house it, perhaps gaming disorder, but that too doesn't actually specifically relate to the mechanics associated with loot boxes. And again, you know how I feel about that. If you don't, check the previous state of the research on gaming disorder. So no, loot boxes are not quote unquote addicting in a clinical psychiatric sense. Are they desirable? Of course. You cannot keep my kids from asking for a Kinder Egg every time we see them at the grocery store. Please stop putting them by the cash registers. Have pity on us parents. In the same way, players really want that Neuer card. And let's be honest, if you knew anything about football, you would too. <laughs> that might offend people. <laughs> so are loot boxes gambling? No. Are they addictive? No. Are they ethical? Mm, that's a bit more tricky. It enters a shady practice territory when they're explicitly marked to younger children. There are issues like fear of missing out and an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex to consider. For more on that, I would visit Dr. Houghton's work, ethicalgames.org. She's really the leading voice in this area. Generally speaking, loot boxes are optional content. That is, you do not need to buy them to experience the full content of the game. 
If loot boxes are not giving you a strategic advantage, that is, if they only contain cosmetic items, and if they can be purchased with in-game money by completing certain tasks or playing for a certain amount of time, if you can buy them for free without engaging in real world money and monetization, I mean, honestly, I don't see anything wrong with that. The ethical argument, but definitely not a legal one. I am encouraged that some companies are starting to list the drop rates of getting certain items. I think this makes it much more clear, especially for younger players, what the odds are are getting the item you're really after. I mean, I need to know, am I going to be invited on a walk on roll in the next season of The Witcher? Or am I more likely to get a legendary drop in Overwatch? Probably the latter. And I don't play Overwatch. If you like this video and want to see more, please like and subscribe. And until next time, be excellent to each other and always cite your sources.